So welcome to Plodcast, episode 122. Good to have you with us. Uh, Glad you uh, are carving time out of your busy schedule to listen to me talk. I have to do it. You don't have to do it. Um, It's optional for you. So, Plodcast, episode 122, and uh, here we go. I want to talk a little bit about uh, No Quarter November, which is something I did in my blog uh, throughout the course of November, and this is not so much about No Quarter Quarter November uh, in itself as it is um, about some of the um, things that that shook loose as a result of No Quarter November. One of the things that um, is happening, and this is, uh, I need to give a a little brief explanation about um, something that's going on here, and I think a number of you who listen to this podcast probably uh, have examples of this yourself, but uh, what it boils down to is this. In the, in the national uh, scheme of things, take the broad, reformed, evangelical world. Uh, what's happening in Moscow is, um, whether it's New St. Andrews College or the Impact of Logos School or uh, the Ministry of Christ Church or Canon Press, or there's a bunch of, there, there are a bunch of things um, happening here. And and my blog is one of those things that's happening here. Uh, there's a respectable establishment that um, that basically has all things Moscow under embargo, um, and there are there are two um, two aspects to this. Uh, some of the people who are um, are embargoing um, our content, not mentioning it, not referring to it not quoting it, not citing it, uh, those people can be divided into two uh, categories. Uh, uh, the first category would be the obvious one. The people are ignoring it, uh, not promoting it, not uh, applauding it, not interacting with it, not giving it the dignity of a discussion because they don't like it. Right? They, they disagree with it or they have some objection to it. And... Uh, why should they promote something they don't agree with? And one sees their point, of course. Um, the second group of uh, folks are participating in the uh, embargo, albeit somewhat reluctantly. And the reason they're participating in the embargo is because of what happens if they don't. The embargo is um, is policed. All right. So what happens is this, and this is something that, that I noticed uh, as part of the shaking out of uh, No Quarter November. During No Quarter November, I, I blog uh, on a number of topics without qualifying anything. And this is one of the, one of the things that we do that sort of uh, makes some noise, it gets some attention, and it, has, it results in a, a shaking loose or a, uh, the, the embargo becomes a little bit more porous. So then what happens is this. If somebody, uh, let's say I tweet something and somebody retweets it, or somebody refers to something that I did, there are, um, there are a group, and I, uh, I don't know exactly how many of, there, uh, how many of them there are, uh, a comparative ha- handful, but we can call them troll guardians. So not guardians of the trolls, but trolls who are guardians of the embargo. So what will happen is if somebody says, um, uh, l- l- let's say, I'll just make up an example. Let's say my, my wife wrote something on Christian women and prayer, and I tweeted that, and somebody with some sort of significant following retweeted it. L- l- okay, this is a good article on prayer. There will be a cluster of people almost immediately uh, surrounding that person saying, why are you, why are you quoting uh, Wilson, don't you know that he protects pedophiles, or don't you know that he adores slavery? He just loves slavery. Uh, don't you know that he did this and he did that and he did the other thing? So basically, uh, there are people who generally, generically, like what we do, but they don't like it so much that they're prepared to have uh, that they're prepared to be swarmed by trolls. So what happens is the uh, the embargo is well it it is um, worked relatively well but not uh, not as well as they would like 
And there are uh, definite signs of it weakening, and uh, no quarter November is part of that. And the the uh, Amazon Prime show that we have, Man Rampant, is um, is an, you know, sort of an end run around the embargo. There are are different things that are uh, breaking through, and and so consequently, people are starting to up the amperage, and they're they're yelling. The most recent thing uh, down to down to yesterday was um, a resurrection of the federal vision um, thing. Uh, how dare you? Why are you quoting um, Doug Wilson? He's a federal visionist, and uh, five different reform denominations condemned federal vision, and he denies justification by faith alone, and da da da. And of course, I do not uh, deny justification by faith alone. I, I affirm it, I affirm it robustly. Uh, I affirm the imputation of the act of obedience of Christ and the imputation of the passive obedience of Christ. Um, this imputed righteousness is a forensic declaration for our uh, justification, etc. You, you show me a reform statement on um, justification by faith alone, and I will sign it, and I will sign it in my blood. So the noise is just ridiculous. But it doesn't matter if you're if you're trolling people, if you're just creating a commotion, and all someone wanted to do was say something nice about prayer, and they wanted to say, oh, uh, uh, Nancy Wilson, she's a sweet lady, and she wrote this nice thing about prayer. Uh, good luck. Yeah, it, basically, it's the, the, there are people who will not be uh, reasoned with, who cannot be, um, uh, you know, no explanation is good enough. You, you, uh, state it in, 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 if I were to state, um, uh, for example, to Scott Clark, um, I said, give me, um, give me a statement that passes muster with you, write up a paragraph that you, that, that you would affirm about justification by faith alone. And I will read it and then I will sign it in front of you. And you will then say, I don't believe you. So that's the, that's what we're up against. basically that's what we're uh, dealing with that's what is um is happening. But I'm not saying this. I'm not sharing uh this with you, oh listener, because I'm having a pity party or anything like that. I'm not I'm not out here uh feeling sorry for myself. It's um uh not at all. It's actually this is all very heartening. It's a very good sign. It's um it's an indication that things are right on schedule and um we're not worried about it. You shouldn't be worried about it. But neither should you be uh, cowed or intimidated um, by the inevitable appearance of the trolls who will let you have it if you, uh, if you, um, as I've seen on Twitter, Moscow man bad, right? So Moscow man bad. If anybody uh, starts to th act like some of these things might not, you know, there might be another side to a lot of these uh, accusations. There might be another angle on it. Um, then the amperage, the volume, the decibel level will simply go up. So there you are. Um, the, all the stuff that you hear from the trolls, if, if, you've, if you follow what we're doing uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on the blog, you will notice this at some point. And when, when something like this breaks out, just, be rest, just rest assured that the, the trolls are not what might be called a repository of accuracy. So, Hamartiology. We're continuing with podcast episode 122, and we come to our um, Hamartiology section, which is, of course, I keep reminding you, the study of sin. All of us are Hamartiology majors, and we shouldn't be. So that's why, that's why we're uh, considering these things. When um, when we um, look at the next word, th this next word is hapax, meaning that it occurs in the New Testament only once. Um, so hapax is a, a, a single solitary occurrence, which means that if you want to get contextual meanings, you have to go outside um, uh, the literature of the New Testament. Um, the word is architalones, architalones, and it means chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, but a chief 
tax collector. And this, of course, is what Zacchaeus was. The word is found, the, the solitary use of it is found in Luke 19, verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. So the, uh, there's one word underneath all of that, the chief among the publicans. He was the head tax collector, and he was rich. Now, it might seem odd to include this word in a review of what the New Testament teaches, teaches us about all the different sins, but on reflection, it does make sense. The first thing to note is how routinely the tax collectors are lumped together with all the lowlifes in the, throughout the uh, New Testament. For example, in uh, Mark 2.15, And it came to pass that, as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. So note, the, this is a phrase um, that just goes together, publicans and sinners, tax collectors and sinners. So publicans and sinners or tax collectors and sinners just go together, like ham and eggs or salt and pepper. Uh, that this was not an unjust assessment is seen in how Zacchaeus professes his repentance by offering to make restitution. So when Jesus says that salvation has come to this house and everybody's grumbling at, at uh, Jesus giving the time of day to Zacchaeus, uh, Zacchaeus promises to make restitution if he's wronged uh, anybody. And this was fitting because he was a chief tax collector. Now, these people were despised on two accounts, uh, the tax collectors and how much more would the chief tax collector be despised on these two accounts. The first is that they were quislings. They were collaborators with the hated Romans. They were traitors to their people. The Romans were uh, governing uh, the Jews, and the Jew, there was a great deal of uh, cum accumulated sentiment against what the Romans were doing. And, um, and so these were Jews who had basically agreed to work for the opposition. They were quislings, they were traitors, they were collaborators. The second reason also had a real bite to it. The Romans required a certain amount from the tax collectors, and anything beyond that that they could squeeze out of the people, they were free to keep. Uh, in other words, they were like a collection agency. And uh, Rome says, this is what we want. And if you went to someone and you, by your techniques, got... 50% more than that, uh, you got to keep that 50%. So the text we just read says that Zacchaeus was rich, and all the people there watching, uh, watching Jesus knew just where his riches had come from. Uh, in other words, uh, Zacchaeus was not, not rich accidentally. But Jesus came to break all of that down. He called two men to be his disciples who would have been natural political enemies. Simon the Zealot was part of the French resistance, that's in Luke 6.15, and Levi, or Matthew, collected taxes while working for the Vichy government, that's in Mark 2.14. And then back in the Luke passage in Luke 6.15, where it mentions Simon the Zealot, the first one mentioned in that verse is Matthew. So Matthew, the collaborator, is called to be a disciple right alongside Simon the Zealot, who was a, uh, a resistance um, a fighter or resistance worker, someone who is uh, definitely on the anti-Roman side of things. Well, for my uh, book review this time around, I wanted to um, uh, review a book by um, uh, a gent named Leif Enger, uh, Leif Enger wrote the acclaimed book, Peace Like a River, which uh, I would have to rank as one of my favorite uh, novels. Uh, it, it's just, it's magnificent. Um, his second novel uh, was something like So Brave, So Young, So Handsome, and, uh, which I read, and it was okay. It didn't, it didn't float my boat the way uh, Peace Like a River did. I don't think it was his strongest um, effort although he is a craftsman and he writes very well. And a, a couple of Christmases ago, I think, it was a, I think it was a Christmas present or a birthday present, I forget which, I was given a copy of um, his most recent novel, which is called Virgil Wander. Virgil Wander, which I uh, read through and enjoyed very much. I don't, I, it doesn't quite get to the, it, it didn't quite get to the level of Peace Like a River, but it, 
it was up there. It was a good, it was a good book. Um, with Peace Like a River, it's, Peace Like a River is one of those odd books where you, after you've read three pages, you care desperately what happens to everybody. Uh, it, he just did something uh, magical in the first, uh, in the opening of Peace Like a River. And, and Peace Like a River has some of my favorite scenes um, in it. It's sort of a supernatural realist book, The Occasional Miracle. Uh, and it culminates in a grand meal uh, miracle with no no spoilers here. But uh, basically, uh, Leifanger writes very, very well. Virgil Wander has the same um, uh, the same sort of um, ability to grab you and make you care about the characters. Um, this is um, Virgil Wander's that it's written in the first person and uh, it's about a guy in a, who's just recently had an accident. He's recovering from that accident. He runs an old uh, movie theater in an upper Midwest town, and uh, and the town is a dying town, and uh, not much happens. There are no explosions or motorcycles to speak of in the book, and um, and yet you're made to care very much. So in Peace Like a River, if on a scale of one to ten. If in, by the end of the first chapter, you, your your level of investment and in caring about all the characters is like an eleven out of one through ten, um, uh, Virgil Wander, I would put it at an eight or a nine. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I don't. I'm not sure that Anger is ever going to be able to surpass what he did with his first book in my mind. But he he gets in the same league with Virgil Wander, so. It's um. Not a high drama, high stakes, no, uh, uh, it's not that kind of a book. It's more of a uh, uh, character study, um, uh, and, and anger really shines when it comes to descriptions and descriptions of people and, and uh, making you see with your mind's eye what's, um, what's there, there in front of you on the page is actually there in front of you in your mind's eye. Um, if you, if you would like a quiet sketch of uh, descriptive character study that holds your interest, there's enough of a plot and enough of a mystery and enough of a what might happen that it keeps you through, pulls you through to the end. Um, Anger succeeds in what the um, what every author should be attempting to do, which is to make you want to turn the next page. So, Virgil Wander by Leaf Anger.